All right, I want the audience to imagine a car real quick. And then think about how the motor of the car is discovery that's driving the car of science forward. And so I am a researcher who studies reptiles and amphibians, a herpetologist and an evolutionary biologist. And the motor of my car, what drives me forward in my own work, is this sense of discovery. It's this passion to discover new things, unknown things about reptiles and amphibians. And you can see that I'm starting my baby daughter off very young on this path of discovering new things about reptiles with a little, her first snake. But we all know that it's not enough just to have an engine in your car. If you want your car to move forward, if you want your science and your discovery to move forward, you have to have a road to drive on. Scientists have to have some sort of a path to follow. And so for scientists, the path that we follow is the scientific method. The scientific method provides this framework that informs each step of our journey of discovery. And so today I want to talk to you guys about one project that I'm working on and show you how the scientific method informs each step of our journey along the way. So we're going to look at the global challenge of amphibian decline. The UN just released this report recently and, and it got a lot of press, so you may have seen it in the news, but one of the things that they said in the report about species at risk of extinction globally is that 40% of all amphibians are at risk of extinction. Now this is a huge component of all amphibians, but it may not seem like such a big deal unless you know one key thing about amphibians. So amphibians, which are frogs and toads and Sicilians and salamanders, which is what we're focusing on today, they actually breathe through their skin. And a lot of amphibians, like these salamanders here, have actually lost their lungs completely, and they breathe exclusively through their skin. Now what this means is it makes them rather sensitive to changes in their environment. In a sense, they're kind of fragile. And so they, they respond negatively to, to rapid changes in their environment. And so they, they serve as what we call indicator species. They're indicative to something going on in the greater ecosystem. I like to think of them as the smoke detector on the ceiling that tells us that the building is on fire. If, if there's a fire going on in the ecosystem, we're going to know right away if we look at the amphibians. And so the first thing we do in science is we make an observation. Our observation is that amphibians are globally in trouble. They're declining. But then we want to ask a question, and we could ask the question, what about amphibians in our own backyard? How are the amphibians in our own backyard doing? And in our own backyard, eastern United States, we could focus on the region of Appalachia. And we might want to focus on this region because Appalachia is actually the global salamander hotspot of the world. It's like the Great Barrier Reef or the Amazon rainforest of salamander diversity. In fact, there are more salamanders in southern Appalachia than anywhere else in the world. Now, just to illustrate this point, I have some photos here from some field work I did about a, about a month ago with a colleague named Ed. So Ed and I were in southern Virginia, and we were hiking along a one-mile stretch of trail looking for salamanders. I'm going to show you a little later how you find them. But along this one-mile stretch of trail, we actually found nine species of salamanders from four different genera. Now, this is an astounding level of diversity for salamanders. But to illustrate the point further, we can look at my home state where I grew up, the state of Nebraska. And in Nebraska, there's actually two species of salamanders from one genus, and they're found on opposite ends of the state. In southern Virginia, on one mountain in Appalachia, along a one-mile stretch of trail, we found nine species of salamanders. So we can focus our question in further, you know, how are amphibians doing globally? How are they doing in our own backyard? How are they doing in Appalachia? And then we could focus in on one group of salamanders in Appalachia, one genus, and that would be the woodland salamanders, the genus Plethodon. Now this is a good group for us to focus in on because they're actually the most speciose, or there's the, the highest number of woodland salamanders in eastern Appalachia, more woodland salamanders than any other kind of salamander. And they're also the most abundant vertebrate in many of their, their habitats. So what this means is that you go to these sites, Ed and I went to the site, and we almost only found salamanders when we were looking around as far as animals are concerned. So these salamanders actually perform a lot of the different ecosystem functions. So the way I think of this is, if you walk into a restaurant, there's a bunch of staff members. You know, you have a host and a hostess, and you have waiters and waitresses, and you have line cooks, and you have the chef, and you have the manager, and you have the investors, and all of these people are performing different functions in the ecosystem, or, or in the restaurant. And so if the restaurant serves as the ecosystem, 
then these salamanders are performing all of those different functions that the staff of the restaurant would be performing. So they're really vital to the ecosystem. And so it's really important to know how these salamanders are doing because that tells us you know, whether or not the, the building's on fire, so to speak. So throughout the rest of the talk, we're going to focus in on this question of how are woodland salamanders doing, essentially? Are they at risk of extinction? And we're going to see this figure here, and uh, it's just a cartoon that I drew, but it represents the abundances or population sizes or the health of the, the salamander species through time. So starting at one time point, in this case 1970s, where our story starts today, we see that the line is really high on the graph. So this means that there's a lot of salamanders. And as you move through time, the line would be going down, suggesting that there would be fewer salamanders in present day. Now before we can make a hypothesis and then you know, gather data to test our hypothesis and then communicate our findings to the public, we uh, need to gather some background research. And so our background research today starts with this guy, the godfather of woodland salamanders, Richard Hyten. So Dr. Hyten was a professor, still a professor, at the University of Maryland at College Park, and he was really active in the field all across the eastern United States for decades, from the 50s and 60s and 70s and 80s, even into the 1990s, and today he's still writing papers about these salamanders. And in the process of working over decades, Hyten got this really good feeling for when he'd find these salamanders. So these salamanders, their skin is really sensitive, so they spend most of their life underground. But when the weather conditions are good and their friends are out and they have you know, people, other salamanders to hang out with, they come up and they, they eat insects and they breed with one another. And so he, he would kind of get a feeling for like what time of year he would find these salamanders, how many he would find at a given site, uh, which species were found together. And what he, what he kind of started to feel is that sometime around 1980, there just seemed to be less Salamanders. So in the 60s and 70s, he could find tons of them every time he went to these sites. And then in the 80s and 90s, it just seemed like they were much harder to find. And so I, he had some ideas about why that may have been, but he wasn't exactly sure. And so he kind of handed the baton off to the next generation of researchers like myself to test some of the reasons why these salamanders may have been declining. But nonetheless, it was a big deal because if, in fact, woodland salamanders are declining, it's saying that the ecosystem is in big trouble. Going with our smoke, smoke detector analogy, the ecosystem is on fire. These really important species are declining. And so moving on in our story, there was another group of researchers that pre preceded myself in the early 2000s, and they wanted to test if Hyden's hypothesis was true. Were woodland salamanders, in fact, declining? And so they went out into the field, and they visited hundreds of sites throughout Appalachia, and they counted the number of salamanders, and they counted the different species of salamanders, and they found that, in fact, they were finding less salamanders than Hyden said he found back in the 70s. So they said Hyden was right. Woodland salamanders are, in fact, declining. And they had one specific hypothesis that, about what could be driving these declines. They thought, we bet it's this one disease is probably causing these declines. So across the world, this, this issue of amphibian disease, one of the big culprits is this disease called chytrid, or this fungus called chytrid. And uh, the fungus actually grows on the skin of the amphibians, so their skin is really important to their life history. And so this fungus, it grows on their skin and it kills them. And so you can swab the skin of the, the salamanders, and much like if you've ever sent your DNA to Ancestry.com or 23andMe or something, you could like swab your, the inside of your mouth, or you can spit into a vial. So you do the same sort of thing with the salamanders. You swab them, and then you can extract and sequence the DNA. You can use that DNA extraction to test for the presence of this fungus. So they did that in their modern samples, and then they found no evidence of the fungus. So they said, well, there must not be a fungus present in the populations today, but oftentimes in science, when your data doesn't support your hypothesis, you just make a new hypothesis, you kind of start over. And so they made a new hypothesis, and that was maybe chytrid was really common in the population before the crash, and then something happened where the chytrid just killed off most of the salamanders, and the ones that survived today are just immune to the, to the disease, so we don't see any evidence for it. So they did the same sort of test, but with many, many more animals, and they found no evidence of chytrid there. So they sort of threw up their hands and said, it seems that plethodon are declining, but we're not sure why. And even today, no one really knows why, and it's, it's rather difficult to identify the exact cause. 
But what we do know is that regardless of the cause, there is one consequence that we can identify of these declines. And so our hypothesis today, we've done our background research, we see that there's evidence that they've declined, but the consequence of the decline is what we're going to make our hypothesis about. And that's that as populations have declined through time, we hypothesize that the genetic diversity has also declined through time. So we expect a correlation between genetic diversity and population sizes. So we can sort of think of it like this. If the genetic, genetic diversity is just a way to measure the amount of variation in the genetic material that the population's carrying around. So if the colors represent genetic variation, and we have a, a lot of salamanders in our population, we have lots of variation in the genetic material. And this, this is sort of like having a fat bank account. If you have a nice emergency fund and something happens like your car breaks down, you have a lot of money to use to fix your car. You have room to maneuver, and so they can use this genetic variation to adapt to changes in their environment, emergencies, so to speak, that happen in their environment. But if their population size shrinks and they go into a decline, now they have much less variation in their genetic material to use to react. So if your bank account suddenly runs out of money and your car breaks down, now you have no money to use to respond to that emergency that happened in your life. So just our bank account sort of represents the amount of genetic variation that the populations can use to respond to changes in their environment. All right, so we've gathered background material. We've made this hypothesis that genetic diversity has declined through time if, in fact, these salamanders are declining. So now to test the hypothesis, the first thing that I did, this is where I answer the story, I did some field work in southern Appalachia and I visited two field sites and collected modern samples to get modern tissue samples to extract DNA from these salamanders. So I thought it'd be helpful to illustrate kind of what that looks like. So all my field work took place on the Appalachian Trail. And the way that you find these salamanders, you have to catch them, is you go out at night is the best time with a headlight on and you walk along the trail. And then right along the bank, especially you know, where I have three multicolored ones along the right side of the trail there, you, you look for the salamanders sitting out. They come out at night to, to breed and to find insects to eat. And so you see them in your headlight, but they don't really look bright and gigantic and colorful. I just did that so you guys could see them on the screen. But here is what they actually look like in life, although they're actually much smaller, they're still kind of gigantic. But here's the three salamanders. Maybe you could see them, I don't know. But that's what it looks like when you're finding them at night. And then during the day, you go out and it's much harder work. You end up sweating a lot and getting devoured by mosquitoes. But you uh, go along the hillside or in little ravines and stuff, and you use this hook for a snake hook, we call it. And you flip over logs and rocks, and then you see the salamanders. They're not giants and multicolored like this. They look little and brown, more like this. And then you see them wiggling, and you dive on top of them. And something that's really fascinating about these salamanders, it has nothing to do with their declines, but they're actually, a lot of them are called slimy salamanders. And the reason is because when they're threatened, they actually exude this slime off their skin, much like a slug, except that it's like super glue. And it, it stays on your hands for days at a time. So after you dive on the salamander, then it slimes you, and then your hand is sticky, like like when super glue doesn't come off, you know how your skin kind of peels off with the super glue? It's like that. So if you catch like a hundred of these salamanders, your hands just turn black with slime. It's kind of a bad side effect of working on these animals. And no one told me that before I got into it. Imagine eating your dinner at night in the field, you know, with your hands like that, because it doesn't, it doesn't really wash off. So anyway, I collected these modern samples, and now the experimental design to test our hypothesis about changes in genetic diversity is I'm extracting DNA from the modern samples and then sequencing the DNA. And then I'm also using samples that Haydn collected in 1980. And that's, that's kind of like right around the time of the crash. So I have modern samples that are way after the crash. I have samples right around the time of the crash. And then I have samples from before the crash, 1970. And what's really exciting here is that uh, only in the last couple of years have methods been invented to get DNA from samples collected in the 70s and earlier. So these are actually museum samples that Haydn preserved and, and deposited at the Smithsonian. And with modern methods, we can get DNA and sequence that DNA, whereas in the past, you know, that, that wasn't possible at all. So it's really exciting new innovation, and, and it allows us to look at this change in genetic diversity through time. All right, so after sequencing the DNA, 
then you use computer software to look at the number of differences between individuals, and this is how we estimate the genetic diversity. So we can get an idea of genetic diversity for each species based on the number of differences in the DNA sequence within a population. And finally, by looking at how genetic diversity has changed through time for each species at each site, we can kind of get an idea of how the entire ecosystem is doing. So it's kind of the equivalent of walking into a restaurant and doing a satisfaction survey of the server and the waiter and the cook and the manager. You know, you get an idea of the health of the entire restaurant. And so by looking at multiple species from multiple sites, we can see how diversity has changed across the entire community. And what I find really exciting about this is that this project is using brand new methods to answer old questions that Hyten made decades ago that then have immediate conservation implications. Because if these salamanders are declining, it's important to know because they're really important to the ecosystem. And so to, to close today, I was thinking how today's theme is all about going into the unknown. And in a sense, science is also all about going into the unknown. Because we're asking questions and we're making hypotheses and testing them. And it's always about things that we don't know. You know, we're driven forward by this desire to discover, this curiosity to know things that we don't already know. But what's a bit paradoxical about the scientific process is that when we finally arrive, we finally get the answer to our question. When we finally analyze our data and look back and see if it supported our hypothesis or not. In science, just as in life, arriving where you thought you'd know the answer oftentimes ends up unearthing more questions than you even started with. And so, oftentimes in science, once you arrive, so to speak, you end up circling back and making new hypotheses that you test. And this is how science builds upon itself and advances the body of knowledge. But what I find most exciting about that is that no one person, like Hyten in our story, no one generation, like the other researchers from the University of Maryland, are able to, to accumulate all knowledge in a given area, are able to discover all the things that there is to know in any direction of the natural world. And so they have to hand off the baton to the next generation, and the next generation gets to step up to the plate like I get to today, and discover new things, and, and in a sense, keep going into the unknown. And so I'm really excited about the potential for sort of unlimited discovery for young people, and the natural world is so full of things to discover. With that, I'll say thank you, and I think we have time for some questions.